First of all, thank you to Neil for joining. Neil is going to talk about Sequoia uh, PGP. Uh, this is one of main components. Now, instead, to, to the context, uh, I'm involved in a project um, at uh, Biomed IT, PHI, and here we are. We have a web app. We are mainly maintaining two applications. Uh, one is a web application, and the other one is a desktop application called SET. And we are in the process of rewriting SET in Rust. And one of the main components uh, in SET is Sequoia. Exactly. And um, yeah. I think that's all. So the stage is you. Thanks for me. Thank you very much. So the, the title of my talk is Sequoia PGP, which is the library and ecosystem that I'm working on. And the subtitle is Following a Moral Imperative. And that's sort of why I'm working on Sequoia PGP. And I want to share that with you today. But the, the moral imperative, I feel, applies not only to, to me and my own work, but it should apply to you. And I want to convince you that this is a moral imperative, a universal moral imperative that you have to apply to your own work. So the outline of my talk is I'm going to start talking about human rights. Then we'll talk about PGP, a look at open PGP, which is a standard. And then, very briefly, I'll, I'll talk about my project. So the internet, everybody is on the internet. The internet is a, a wonderful place. There are pictures of cats. It also is a place of abuse. And the internet makes abuse so easy. And the programs we write are not neutral. They are tools that can be used to harm or to protect individuals. And even if we're working on something that is not directly being used by people in danger, like journalists in Russia or other activists, normal people also need protection. Normal people have human rights. Human rights are, are fundamental. Anybody who is a human is entitled to these human rights. And fundamental means that this is without compromise. It doesn't matter how much money somebody offers you, you cannot violate human rights. They are fundamental. Protecting human rights is a moral imperative that everyone must be engaged in. But what are human rights? The canonical reference is perhaps the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was written after World War II. It codifies 30 freedoms and rights. And it was ratified in 1948. It was a non-binding ratification. Since then, there have been nine documents. And every country in the UN has certified at least one of them, most of them the majority. And I want to read three human rights to you from this document. The first one is the right to personal security. Everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of person. So when we think about someone being hurt on the street or being mobbed, this is, this is security, right? There's physical harm that can potentially be done. Freedom of speech. Everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. Doesn't mean that people have to listen but everybody is allowed to say what they think without consequence. Right to privacy. No one shall be subjected to arbitrary interference with his privacy. So there are three human rights that I've listed here out of the 30 that were codified in this document. Security, free expression, and privacy. Now I think that the first two are sort of easy to understand. Everybody has, or most people have, an intuitive grasp of security and freedom of expression. But what is, what is privacy? Um, a lot of people think about privacy as being something to hide, and they say, well, I have nothing to hide. I don't need privacy. But is it really something to hide? 
And I do not think that privacy is about hiding anything. Privacy is a type of consent. Privacy is control over personal information. What does that mean in practice? So I may practice ballet, and I may even tell you that I practice ballet. But that does not mean that you have the right to watch me or to spy on me. Only if I give you my informed consent is that okay. And so, who, who cares, right? Why? Why is this important? When somebody is watching you, it changes the way you do the thing that you're doing. All of a sudden, it goes from focusing on the task to a performative act, where you are on the stage. Your attention becomes divided. You're more focused on your appearance than the results of the task that you're trying to accomplish. You become afraid to make mistakes. Have you ever been exercising and then somebody comes in and all of a sudden, normally you can do 15 push-ups and just doing one more becomes an issue because they're, they're looking at you. Or you're, you're practicing dancing or you're learning or you're working at the office and then somebody comes and looks over your shoulder and all of a sudden you're completely out of your flow. Even though that person didn't say anything, they're just watching what you're doing, you're being observed. <laughs> All of a sudden, you become afraid to make a mistake. Less privacy results in less experimentation. And humans need a space for experimentation. We have to have the opportunity to make mistakes without consequences. There are many willful privacy violations. There's mass surveillance by governments and there's surveillance capitalism. And all you have to do is look on the internet and visit any page in the EU, and, or almost any page, and you immediately see a dark pattern. You know, do we have your consent to <coughs> collect all of your data? And OK is sort of the obvious option, right? And reject all is, is somehow a little bit hidden. It's harder to find. You have to work for it. The easy thing is to just say yes. And what is being done is we're tricking users into doing something they wouldn't normally do. We're tricking them into violating their privacy. But there are ne negligent privacy violations as well, and these are just as important. Any sort of data retention, any time we're collecting data and storing it from users, there will be a data breach, and all data will eventually be public. And even the best get owned. And they don't get owned once, they get owned over and over and over. One really good example is Yahoo, who every few years has billions of records of data that just flow onto the internet. And the harm is real. Facebook gave police the private data of some people, this is in the US, and the police came and they arrested a mother and her child because her daughter got an abortion, and that is now illegal in the US. And the only reason that happened is because Facebook shared that data. That's, that's unacceptable. The harm is real. The moral imperative is hopefully clear. We have to resist. In our jobs, as programmers, we have much power. We must refuse to violate human rights. We must refuse to help others violate human rights. And that means educating our clients and our bosses in just doing my job is not an excuse. And when we build things, we have the moral imperative to design the software to protect our users' privacy. We must only collect data that is absolutely necessary for doing the job at hand, not because we think in the future maybe that data can be monetized or could be useful. And in practice, that means that any data we collect, we have to encrypt and we have to be constantly authenticating things to make sure that it doesn't go to the wrong people. 
So I want to switch gears a little bit to PGP, because PGP is fundamentally a human rights project. It was started by Phil Zimmerman, he's on the left, and here we are in front of the uh, International Court of um, Justice in The Hague. And uh, Phil Zimmerman was a peace activist in the 80s in the US. And he observed that the government was not so happy with their work and was breaking into offices, spying on them, observing their communication. And he wanted to help and he had the ability to help because he was a programmer professional. And so he wanted to write a tool to protect grassroots political organizations. And the tool that he wrote was called PGP, Pretty Good Privacy. And it's a tool for cryptographically protecting communication. So it's fundamentally a human rights project. The first version was released in 1991 in the US, which means that it's now 32 years old. And in 1993, two years later, the US government pursued Phil Zimmerman for, or was a criminal investigation for munitions export without a license, which is, is pretty serious. In the US at the time, the only thing that was allowed was 40-bit encryption, and PGP, the default, was 128-bit. Phil came up with a workaround during this case. You would publish a book, and users would scan the code. And it wasn't just dumping all of the PGP code into a book. There was, there was a little bit more work involved there. They designed a special font that was ideal for scanning. At the end of every line, they had a checksum, and at the bottom of every page, there was a checksum. And the just so happened there was also software out there that made this all easy to check these checksums. So MIT Press, which is a very prestigious uh, publishing house, published this book. And people, for instance, in Germany, bought the book and scanned it in and released PGPI, which was the international version of PGP. And and this was the workaround, and it worked because the US government couldn't really say that a book was somehow a weapon. The US dropped the case in 1996, and since then we've had strong encryption for all. Well, almost, because it's constantly under threat. And right now we have, for instance, the EU's Chat Control 2.0, which is legislation that is basically prohibiting the use of secure messages and private conversations. So from PGP, we come to OpenPGP, which is an IETF standard. In 1996, the first version was released. Shortly thereafter, we saw other versions of OpenPGP on the market, like GNU PG. and Work is still being done on the standard. So there was a lot of work recently in the working group, and then it's a new version of the standard coming out. It's referred to as the cryptographic refresh. And it includes, for instance, authenticated encryption and Argon2 and a whole bunch of other things. And here's a list of, uh, of the most active free software implementations of OpenPGP. GNU-PG, is uh, perhaps the most well-known, it's the oldest, but there are a whole bunch of others, and these are the ones that are actively developed, which means that there are people that are constantly contributing to them. And we see that pretty much every language ecosystem has at least one implementation. And the scope of OpenPGP is to describe a network protocol, so it describes the wire format, like where the bits belong and how you create a message. And it also defines the mechanisms for encryption, signing, and authentication. And when we think of authentication, we should think of like public key infrastructure. It defines two basic data structures. There are messages and there are certificates. And these data structures are made up of packets. So it's not that you have a sort of fixed buffer and then everything is described within this buffer. And if you want to update it, you need like a new buffer. You have packets and you can add packets to it. So let's look at a, an encrypted message quickly. An encrypted message has the encrypted data here at the end in the site D packet. 
that's encrypted with a session key, so using, for instance, AES. And then in front of that, we have these PKESKs, and PKESK stands for Public Key Encrypted Session Key. So the session key is encrypted using each recipient's public key. So I have a public key, and Christian has a public key, and somebody wants to send us a message. So it would be encrypted first using the session key, and then that session key would be encrypted two times, once with Christian's public key and once with my public key. And this means that the size of a message is more or less, or the size of the encrypted message is more or less the size of plain text plus these tiny uh, PKESKs at the front. And a signed message is, is fundamentally the same thing. You have a bunch of packets. And in order to enable streaming, we have the one pass signature packets at the front. And this includes the, the metadata that's needed in order to verify the signature. And in the middle, we have a literal data packet, which is the data, in this case, that's going to be signed. But it could be that the data is only encrypted, for instance. And normally, the signed message is what's inside of the site D packet, so it's a nested data structure. And what we see here also is that we have two signatures, and the signatures are sort of nesting the literal data. And what does a certificate look like? A certificate has a, a primary key at the very beginning. This is sort of the identity key that you might know of from matrix or signal. And <clears throat> that's a, a public key. And then we have underneath it, or after it, logically, some identities and some subkeys. So we have an encryption subkey here, and we have a signing subkey, and then we have Alice, who has two identities, Alice at example.org and Alice at other.org. And in between, we have these binding signatures, which I'll get to in a minute. Now, the binding signatures also include metadata about, for instance, key expiration, the capabilities of the individual keys and some user preferences. <coughs> so up here I have primary key and then in parentheses fingerprint. The fingerprint is derived from the primary key, so it's not derived from the whole certificate. The fingerprint is just a derivation of the primary key. Basically we hash the, the public key and then we get out this long hex string. And this uniquely identifies the certificate. It's impossible to come up with another fingerprint or to come up with another key with the same fingerprint. Um, there's not enough energy in the universe. So if you want to talk about a certificate, you can uniquely identify it using its fingerprints. And then we have these binding signatures. So how do we go from the primary key to the rest of the stuff? How do we know that this encryption key actually should sort of belong to the primary key, because the fingerprint can only identify the primary key, right? It's the hash of the primary key, but the encryption key is separate. And so what we have is this binding signature, which is linking an individual component to the primary key. So the primary key creates a, a signature that is over the primary key and, for instance, the encryption key. And then it saves it with the certificate, and that's what's referred to as a binding signature because it's binding the encryption key to the primary key. If I get a certificate, and I can authenticate the certificate based on the fingerprint, then I can chain forward and authenticate each of the individual components by verifying the binding signature. Right? If the binding signature is good, that means that the primary key must have created that signature, and if the primary key created that signature, it's an attestation that the encryption key belongs to this certificate. So the chain is fingerprint, primary key, and then encryption key. And this means that it's easy to update a certificate. So we don't need to issue new certificates in PGP when we want to add a new user ID or something like that. We just simply add a couple of additional packets. And so then we have this huge public key infrastructure. So for instance, just as my colleague may want to certify that this certificate uh, or the, the fingerprint belongs to me. Eustace would create an OpenPGP artifact called a certification. The implementations of OpenPGP are able to reason about these certifications. And then Christian, 
might be able to say, okay, I can authenticate Neil because I know Eustace and I trust Eustace to authenticate Neil. And now I know what certificate to use for Neil. And these artifacts can be published, but they don't have to be. In PGP, everyone acts like an authentication authority. And users have their own personal trust routes. Now, of course, it might be that an administrator comes along and says, these are your trust routes. But um, this is sort of fundamentally different from WebPKI, where in WebPKI, you have like 300 um, either commercial or government controlled uh, CAs, and basically everybody in the world has to trust them if they want to use the web. There's no alternative PKI. And in PGP, that's, that's not the case. It's firstly a peer-to-peer a -peer model, but on top of a peer-to-peer -peer model, you can easily build a federated system or a centralized system like X509, also known as WebPKI. And this means that OpenPGP's Web of Trust is a a superset of X509, actually. So it is, is more powerful. You can build X509 using OpenPGP's primitives. So what's an example of using OpenPGP's PKI? Well, in, in Debian, Debian is a, a Linux distribution, and there are probably a thousand uh, developers and maintainers, and they package the individual software like Sequoia, and they upload it to the servers. And then Debian goes ahead and distributes the software. That's sort of like the very first approximation of what's going on. Um, and, and how does Debian know that the packages that are uploaded are, are good? In Debian's case, they have the developer sign the package that they upload using an OpenPGP certificate. And then the uploaded package includes the signature. And then the Debian infrastructure looks at the package and the signature, it checks is the signature valid, and if the signature is valid, and the person who issued it or the certificate that issued it is authorized to upload software, then it's accepted by the system. And the nice thing about this model is that the uploads can be audited later, right? There isn't a machine that makes a decision, and then once that decision is made, the decision is sort of gone, right? It's ephemeral the machine is sort of only acting as an untrusted relay. It's the, the signature itself that proves that the software is, is reasonable. And the same can be done for a website with encrypted communication. So for instance, Anon.io is an uh, anonymous um, email forwarding system, so you can go there, create an account, and say, okay, I, I want to interact with uh, Amazon, but I don't want to give them my personal email address, so I create a special email address that's just for Amazon, and later I can disable it. And they support using OpenPGP. You can open, upload an OpenPGP certificate. It's stored in the database, and before any email is forwarded, it's automatically encrypted to the certificate that's stored there. And that's all of the PKI that you need. You don't need any sort of other servers. And Facebook has been doing this for years as well. So if you're a Facebook user and you have an open PGP certificate, you can ask Facebook to encrypt all messages to you. Now, I wouldn't recommend using <laughs> Facebook <laughs> for many different reasons, but it's kind of cool that they offer this service. So open PGP, and now we go to Sequoia PGP. And this is a project that I started with two other people just over six years ago with Eustace and Kai. And prior to working on Sequoia, all of us were working on GNU PG, which if you think back was one of the other OpenPGP implementations. And these days, I think it's about 22 years old. So rather, rather old, it's been around for a long time. And uh, the project was sponsored by the PAC Foundation up until 2023, a few months ago they went broke. And happily we now have funding from the Sovereign Tech Fund, which is a, an entity that is funded by the German government to sponsor um, critical internet infrastructure. And so happily we got a uh, funding support from them, and that is good until the end of 2024, and after that 
Nobody knows what the future holds. But what's the prehistory? How did we get to Sequoia? Well, in 2015, Werner hired the three of us, and none of us had worked in the open PGP space before, at least not deep lane. And at least for me, and I think also for the others, this was a very sort of formative period. We were working with the GNU PGP code base. Uh, we were talking to developers that were integrating GNU PGP into their products, like Enigmail, which is an extension for using open PGP with Thunderbird. And we also worked with GNU PG users. And during that time, we identified a number of problems and we wanted to make changes. So there were sort of not only like small changes, but, but like big architectural changes that, that we thought were important. And we had disagreements with Werner about the vision. And in the end, we parted ways in the summer of 2017. And then we started this new project. And our philosophy working on Sequoia is that it's not just an open PGP implementation. Right? We're not just taking the spec and translating it into a library and then somebody can go along and use it. But our goal is to improve the whole open PGP ecosystem. And so, yes, we also have an open PGP library, but our goal is to improve existing tools, to develop new tools, and to rethink UX paradigms. And we're even thinking outside of just implementation details and UX, but Interoperability and standardization is something that we take very seriously. And we developed a uh, OpenPGP test suite that is um, used by the working group in order to figure out where implementations are aligned on different things in the standard <laughs> and where there's divergence of opinion. And that's been, been very helpful, not only in the standardization process, but also in sort of identifying issues. And our approach is safety first. So this was the reason that we went with Rust. Six years ago, going with Rust was not an, an obvious choice. If I remember correctly, it was the beginning of 2017 that Rust 1.0 came out. So it was kind of a bet. Um, but it's a bet that we think has definitely paid off. So uh, memory issues are just not an issue. And our approach is, is bottom up. So. We have our OpenPGP library, which uh, Set is using. And then on top of that, we have a set of convenience libraries that we're still working on. So for instance, a public key store, which builds on top of our low-level library. And that's something that Set is also using. And then on top of that, we have a set of tools. For instance, SQ is our command line interface. And then on top of that, uh, we want to build user-facing applications, but we haven't even gotten that far yet. And, and one thing that was very, very important to us at the beginning, and which we had the, the, the privilege of being able to do, was to say that we want no technical debt. And because we were supported by this foundation, um, and our mandate was to create an, an excellent open PGP implementation and improve the ecosystem, we could take the time to do things right. And we've heard from a number of our users that they're happy with our APIs and documentation. And we really put a lot of time into thinking through how those APIs look and writing lots and lots and lots and lots of tests. And those APIs, <clears throat> at least at the, in the low-level library, are we, we've designed them to be unopinionated and policy-free. And the idea behind that is we wanted to create a library where you can do anything you want even crazy things because sometimes doing crazy things is good. And it was also based on the observation that GNU PG is very opinionated. And oftentimes there would be a user of GNU PG, like Enigma, for instance. And they would want to do something that GNU PG almost sort of did, but not quite. And they ended up writing hundreds of lines of code in order to tweak that. And we wanted to avoid that. At the same time, our goal was to not only be allowing anything, but making sure that the easy thing was the safe thing, so secure by default, and, and sort of balancing, juggling all of those balls and keeping them all in the air is not easy, but we, we really try to take the time to do that. And the other thing was documentation, documentation, documentation. We have a lot of API documentation with uh, a lot of examples. The core components, as I mentioned, are the Sequoia OpenBGP, which is the low-level library. We have a networking library that you can use for talking to key servers or 
doing gain or WKD or any other thing. There's this public key store, private key store, the web of trust engine, there are some other components. And then we have a number of sort of products, like not libraries, but things that people can actually use. There's SQ, which is our command line interface. So if you're familiar with GNU PG, then the equivalent in that case, in that context is GPG. We have uh, the, the Octopus, which is an alternate backend for Thunderbird. Um, Hagrid, if you use OpenPGP, then there's this key server. Key server is like a, a white pages where you can look up keys by their fingerprint or by their user ID. And that's software that, that we originally wrote and now a different set of people maintain. We have a tool called Sequoia Git, which can be used to help secure a Git repository by defining a policy about how commits have to be signed. And this means that a downstream user of your repository is able to authenticate uh, changes to the repository. Right now, many people sign their commits, but without a policy, it's unclear what a signature means because anybody can sign anything they want. And uh, then we have this interoperability test suite that I mentioned before, which has hundreds of uh, interoperability tests and um, backends for all of the major OpenPGP implementations. So a few users of Sequoia, there's the PEP engine, which is a key management library. This was the other product that was being worked on in the foundation. The RPM package manager, so if you use Fedora or in the future if you use RHEL, then whenever you install software, it's downloaded, the signature is checked, and that's done using Sequoia. Uh, SecureDrop is a whistleblower submission system, and that's recently switched to using Sequoia. There's Anon.io, which is this anonymous email forwarding uh, system that I told you about, and of course, SET, which is something people here probably know about. So let's imagine you want to integrate Sequoia into your product. There are two ways to do it. If you're using Rust, you just do cargo add Sequoia OpenPGP, you read a little bit of documentation, and you're done, you're happy, and you go on. If you're not using Rust, the other thing to do is just to rewrite it in Rust, of course. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no. So the way that we started was we had generic bindings because not everybody uses Rust. And what we found out very quickly is that wrapping a large low-level API is, is hard. It's hard to do in a policy-free manner. And it is very buggy very quickly because you often have these impedance mismatches between, the, between Rust and the language that you're targeting. Um, and so you, you lose a lot of protection of the language boundary. And it was just a complete disaster doing our C wrapper. So what we recommend these days is doing what we call a point solution, which is basically a, a small Rust library that exports only the needed functionality. And this minimizes the impedance mismatches because you know on the application side exactly the semantics that you need, and so that you write a small function in Rust, and that implements exactly what you need, and then you're done. And the other major advantage is that it reduces language boundary crossing, so you have fewer chances for these, uh, these spots where the compiler is no longer able to help you enforce the type system. And here are our four examples. So we have the PEP engine, which is written in C, and it has its point solution. It's uh, 3,700 lines of code. Uh, RPM is 2,400 lines of code. Secure drop is just 400, and an on-IO is also about 400. So it's not much. It depends how much functionality you need. RPM needs more because it does more complex things, and the engine needs even more because it's offering sort of a generic key management system. This is sort of the end, and I want to go back to the beginning because I think that is the, the most important thing, right? I started my talk with the most important thing, and I ended with the least important thing. Sequoia is the least important thing that you should take away today. 
That is not the important thing. The important thing is that we have a moral imperative to respect human rights. We must actively reject surveillance. When we're asked to implement something, we must collect as little personal data as possible, and we must push back if it seems that we're collecting too much. And the data that we do collect, we must encrypt. I believe that PGP is a pretty good solution for the encryption problem. It offers high-level abstractions. The crypto is good. It has a flexible PKI, and the ecosystem is very active. Sequoia is, of course, my preferred implementation. But I, again, that is the, the least important thing that you should take away today. The most important thing is this moral imperative and to reflect, like when I'm implement, implementing something, can I be happy with myself? Am I respecting human rights? Thank you. Thank, thank you, Niels, uh, um, to remind me that uh, my moral imperative Questions to, to Neil? Neil. Hi, my name is Mike Mannion. Hi, thanks for a, a, a lovely talk. I like your uh, strong intro and the emphasis on moral imperative. And like a lot of people that have studied a little bit of ethics and philosophy, I began with imperatives, with Kant's categorical imperative. And like most people, I think, I ended up being a consequentialist. And this is essentially what governments are doing. They're bringing consequentialist arguments against encryption and against the approaches that you're, that you stand for. What do you think are their strongest arguments? If you can straw man their arguments against, against this uh, approach to providing encryption to the masses. I think the, the strongest argument is the argument that is made over and over and over again, which is that if you're going to put backdoors into, uh, the cryptography, then you're not just opening it up to, for instance, the American government, you're opening it up to anyone who has the resources to exploit that back door. And that is almost certainly going to be um, any major government, including the, the Russians, the Chinese, and, you know, the Europe, etc. And then, so I just don't think it's, it's possible from a technical perspective. The alternative is that you say, okay, let's make cryptography illegal. Well, then... That's not going to stop people from using cryptography. It just means only criminals are going to be using cryptography. So I don't think that's a, an argument either. Um, yeah. But if you have other arguments that you want responses to, I can see what I can come up with in two seconds. I'm really putting it out there as something for everybody to think about, to, to be honest. It's not something we can just hash out in, in five minutes. Yeah. So it's always, they're always bringing arguments for, for the provision of backdoors as a kind of, yeah, you can have your encryption as long as we can get in there, mm. uh, which I think, or uh, uh, I'm sure I think is as shaky as you think. I put it to you that um, usability is probably the greatest barrier to adoption beyond beyond the technical uh, side of it. Yeah, yeah, but there there are many levels of usability, so you have to make the library usable. So one of the stories that that we heard is people integrating. Uh, for instance, GNU PG into their program and having to write thousands of lines of code in order to work around sort of quirks or the fact that the interface um, implements the policy is, is too opinionated and the opinion almost matches what the application wants, but but not quite. And so that's that's a problem, right? And uh, in Sequoia, we've tried really hard to avoid that that kind of policy. And I think uh, Christian said it was, it was very easy to integrate Sequoia into their project. And I don't think that, and they had used uh, GNU PG beforehand, and that was not as easy. No, so, GNU PG, I, I mean, uh, we had to, it was a nightmare. It was really a hard uh, argument to move to Sequoia because uh, it, it simplified a lot. A lot of things because maintaining all the different versions and even and all the different system it was not uh, bearable uh, with the time yeah and then at, at the cli level we're sort of doing the same thing where so one of the things that GNU PG does which i think is a little, a little bit crazy is that uh, you have kind of like a sub command 
interface where you can say, I want to encrypt a message. And then you can still specify flags that are only relevant for signing. And then GNU PQ will just ignore them. So you don't have a good partitioning um, between the different subcommands of the flags. You can just throw things in and they get ignored because they aren't used in that context. Uh, and I think that that dramatically decreases the usability of GNU PG and makes it brittle because it means that later, if all of a sudden that flag does have a meaning, then the behavior of software changes. Uh, and so we've been thinking a lot about the CLI level and how we can fix it there and also providing, for instance, the JSON interface so that um, consumers of SQ don't have to write their own parsers. And so the SQ command is great. It's really uh, great to use. Uh, I mean, uh, we, we all like it okay. very much. Yeah. And then the next step is then thinking about, for instance, uh, end user applications. But my hope is to motivate people who are more into sort of the front end stuff to do that work. Thank you. Yeah. And if the three of you, you are funded full time, so just okay. So there were there were three founders. There was Justus, Pi, uh, and me. Uh, and um, after a couple of years, Pi left and went to work on other things. He was interested in open firmware, and so he's gone off in that direction. And so Justus and I are still there. And then there are a few other people. So the team has grown and shrunk. So at one point we were seven people, um, and and right now. We're five people, not all of us are full-time, but Eustace and I are full-time. And part of the reason that we've shrunk a bit was uh, due to uh, a lack of funding. So, as I mentioned, the foundation went bankrupt, and now we have this money from STF, uh, from the German government, which is great and is able to support um, four full-time salaries, but uh, it's, it wasn't enough to keep the whole team. And it's open source, and there are also other committers, or? Uh, Sequoia OpenPHP, and all of the tools around it, all the libraries are LGPL. <coughs> uh, so it's not a um, uh, very liberal license like BSD, but you can build, for instance, the proprietary product on top. We actually started as being GPL, which is where I'd rather be, but it turned out that there were a lot of projects that uh, we were actively preventing from using Sequoia because it was GPL. So, for instance, RPM is LGPL, and they said we can only integrate Sequoia if it's LGPL. And then internally we had discussions, and then we decided, okay, um, it's insane that our goal is to help free software projects, and yet we are actively preventing free software projects from using our code. We have to do LGPL. And so... Um, that's how we ended up there. Mm -hmm. And then we ended up in RPM, so it worked out. And how many other contributors do you have? Ah, uh, yeah, th this tends to be distributed according to like a power law or an exponential. <laughs> so, um, you know, we're doing 95% of the work, but we do regularly have people contributing um, small drive-by contributions. Mm -hmm. One of the tricky things with what we're working on is it is rather complex. It's not something where you can just dive in and say, you know, I want this new feature. I'm just going to quickly implement it on the weekend. Uh, it's not so easy. Yeah. So it requires a certain commitment, and that does raise the, um, the barrier to entry. Yeah. Uh, Robin, you have a question? Yeah, thank you, Neil, for the lovely talk and also for you know, all the hard work on, that you do on Sequoia. Uh, and we just have a, a very general question. Um, like, do you, I mean, it's about how, you know, how much time do you spend to like promote the, the library? I mean, first, do you spend any time promoting it? And if yes, you know, what fraction of the, of the time compared to the development does that represent? Is it, I know, do you spend like 10%, 20, 50% of, of the time to promote it versus uh, developing it? Well, I'm here today. <laughs> I'm giving a talk. Uh, and I spent a few days working on the slides. So uh, certainly I do spend some time kind of promoting it. And uh, I'm not as good at writing blog posts as I would like to be. 
and uh, we regularly go to like Fostem and things like that and talk to people there. But um, yeah, but I, I prefer to spend my time working on sort of the tech side of things. But that's not where I spend most of my time. Uh, a lot of my time is spent more on the, the admin side and trying to organize money and, and that sort of stuff, at least in the last couple of months. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, any other question? To, to Neil? Okay, then if it's not the case, then we can stop the recording. And, and I wish you uh, to all of you a nice afternoon.